Hi folks, are we okay today? Uh, we're live on air today and uh, so just gonna share a few things and I uh, hope everybody's okay. Um, before we start, I've sent out the link, the links under the video, uh, Aaron Ra leaves Manchester. If you go on my channel, uh, the link's there so if anybody wants to come on, you can um, come on there and um, see what's happening so the link is under Aaron Radley's Manchester on my YouTube channel uh, also the link has been sent out to people if anybody uh, wants to come on okay so I'm just going to pray and uh, ask the Lord's blessing Lord Lord we come before you today and uh, we confess our failure and sin we acknowledge our need of you today and so Lord we pray for your forgiveness and uh, pray for your cleansing and uh, pray for your mercies and your grace and Father pray that what's shared on this video um, will be a blessing will be a help uh, and we ask uh, your blessings Lord in your name and for your glory Amen Amen um, so I think uh, I'll share with you stuff that I've been studying over the last few months um, in the scriptures uh, I think uh, I've done quite a few videos on um, the Holy Spirit uh, short videos but I did a big sermon um, about six seven weeks ago on the Holy Spirit um, and basically it was basically saying that the Holy Spirit is unstoppable that when he begins to to move then you can't stop the Holy Spirit and so I was talking about the spirit is spirit and truth that often there is um, spiritual uh, revival claims but yet there is a, a lack of emphasis on the truth and the, there's a need for the balance when in revival to emphasize on the Holy Spirit and in truth so I did a sermon on that when I get a chance um, I'll probably preach it one day on YouTube <clears throat> um, the other one uh, I did a sermon on God will fight for you uh, that was on uh, Exodus chapter 14 I preached it a little bit uh, and that was about you know that when we're in a, a type of spot when we feel cornered that God will will fight for us that God will uh, defenders those who are just coming on at the moment there's a, a few viewers now the link is under Aaron, the video that I've done on Aaron Noir uh, leaves Manchester so if anybody wants to come on, on anybody wants a friendly discussion uh, about any topic can come on um, anybody wanting to cause trouble will be taken off simple as that um, yeah so uh, the the link's gone out as well uh, just to say uh, to about four maybe 800 people so whatever people are doing today maybe they're busy um, the other thing as well uh, the book of Exodus uh, is, a, is about an active God not a passive God that God is active working his purposes out and sometimes we feel that he's not but yet uh, in the book of Exodus uh, he is um, Psalm 42 is a good psalm I think to read uh, if you need encouragement uh, concerning that uh, I've been reading a book on discipleship which mentioned uh, the Rwandan revival uh, and there was a spiritual awakening in Rwanda and yet there was fighting between Christians, the Hooties and Tooties, and one pastor made the point that we can say that we're Christian, but where's the root? Uh, where's the depth? Um, so those are kind of some books that I've a book that I've been reading about discipleship and doing stuff on uh, doing some sermons and stuff. Um, The thought, the thoughts that I've been having um, recently, um, 
I think the gay marriage in Ireland, uh, the uh, elections there, I was pleased to see elections. It was good to see that there was elections for it. Uh, uh, the UK and America didn't brought in gay marriage without uh, a democratic mandate. Uh, the democratic mandate has been brought in by Ireland. I was quite shocked to think that Ireland would, would do that. But I just think it's part of the decay and the fall of the West. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, the West is in decline. It's falling. And uh, you can see the symptoms of decay because you have on one hand this claim that we're dem democratic with the gay rights uh, agenda being taken up by the state, say in Ireland and, and in Western countries. And yet at the same time, uh, democratic rights of Christians are being taken away. So for example, a beggar uh, recently uh, has been told that it's illegal to to not want him make cakes that promote gay marriage uh, because he's a Christian. So the second thing is uh, there are churches that are being closed down in the UK at the present time by the state. Uh, and the arguments are, are going something like, well, uh, these buildings are not fit for purpose, said the fire brigade, or the police go in and question the church about the child protection policy. But actually, it's just the state wanting to clamp down on Christians. I can tell you a church recently that has had this happen, um, where it's been closed down, and it's been a church that's had a, a solid reputation, uh, it's done no wrong, and yet the state's closed it down. This is in the UK. They've had to go and open another building somewhere because the state closed the building down, and, and they had no right to close that building down. Absolutely no right whatsoever. So on, on one hand, we've got this gay rights agenda that promotes so-called democracy, and on the other hand, Christian rights are being taken away. So there's a double standard there. And that's why I stood up to the atheists. Yeah, I weren't at the best. I weren't at my best. Yeah, I weren't at my best. But at least I stood up to them on the internet. At least they had the courage, and I, and I, and I, don't, I don't step down from the fact that the atheists on the internet are anti-democratic. And they will take away your free speech if they get the chance to do so. Uh, but that that's systematic, not only of the atheists, but also of the... Uh, not all atheists, I mean, most atheists on the ground are okay, but it's just the internet ones. But the same is with the state. I can tell you a church now where it's been closed down. It's had a long reputation in the community. It's got good leadership. And yet... The police and the fire brigade have conspired together to close it down. Um, and this is happening around the country. Uh, free, uh, street preachers are being having their freedom of speech being taken away. Um, and Christians are slowly but surely losing their rights in the West. Um, so there is a decline in Western culture. There is the, the Western culture is on the verge of collapse, basically. The symptom, the, the West is weak, it's insipid, it's, it's become anti-Semitic, promoting anti-Semitism, pretending it isn't, but it is. You know, we've seen it in France. We've seen uh, Jews, Jewish people leave France and come into England, or even Jewish people leaving England. Um, you know, Jewish people come into England because they feel it's freer than France. But some Jews are going from England to to Israel because they feel that they haven't got the freedom, it, that they're not safe even in the UK. That's the decline of the West. The decline of the West in moral standards. Uh, the decline of the West in the army, <coughs> not taking on Russia and Ukraine as it should have done. Uh, and the vacuum, the vacuum that's been allowed to happen in, in the Middle East with ISIS is a cancer that will that is going to spread because uh, many of these ISIS are already here in the UK, they're already in America, they're already spreading the tentacles and eventually they will want to exercise a political right they'll, and they'll do that by violence. Um, so... 
mass immigration. I'm not against people immigrating to the UK or, or Europe, but too much immigration makes societies unstable and there is mass immigration which destabilizes Western nations. On top of this, there's a lack of intellectual vigor in the West. The academics in the West are a disgrace. Um, how can you be proud to be an academic in the Western world when um, they had a, a debate like uh, filmed in at Oxford Debate and Society with Dr. Zaki Knight? This is at Oxford University. And nobody cries out, nobody cries out foul. This is a guy who says that he, he wouldn't allow anybody to have free Christians free speech in, in Muslim countries. So all, all, all along the line, you know, the pre free press is, the freedom is being taken away in the UK. There are draconian laws in America that people can be arrested and put in prison without trial. There's a Muslim guy been in America for 13 years and he hasn't even had a trial. That is, that is the fall of the West there. It, someone arrested and not even have a trial and be in prison for th arrest for 13 years is disgusting. Guantanamo is a disgrace to the West. It's an absolute disgrace to the West. And every Christian, every everybody should be ashamed of West that, that people can be arrested and never put on trial. And there's duplicity and double standards there. And all this, all the interference that went on in the Middle East 10 years ago and up to, to only a few years ago by the West was all for oil. And now it's left a vacuum. And now the chickens are coming on to roost. The turmoil there is going to spill over, not into the Middle East, but to countries beyond to Turkey, um, to Pakistan, to India, to to Q8 and then through Jordan and then the Islamic State are not going to stop there they're going to go for Jerusalem so these are the end times folks these are the, this is these are the end days this is the end this is the end uh, without a shadow of a doubt we're in the end we're, we're coming to the end the final showdowns coming and so you, you can stand up and, and, and fl fly your flags with it for your gay rights, you can fly your flags for your, for your uh, atheism and your rationalism and all that, but it's over. In fact, it's interesting to know that the, the atheists think they're winning the war, but do you know what's happening at the moment? There's a new wave of something happening. We've had modernism, we've had postmodernism. Do you know what the new wave is now? It's neo-paganism that in the West there is a, a rise of neo-paganism. If you don't believe me, just go and have a look at what's happening in Edinburgh. Look at the festivals that are happening there, the pagan festivals. So, you know, Europe's moving into a neo-paganist movement. So it's becoming anti-rational, not rational, as the atheists wanted to. So the days of, the, the decline is here, the, decline, the collapse is imminent. imminent. Anarchy is coming. And on top of that, what, what what's the church doing? In the West, the church is uh, being revived a little bit by um, asylum seekers and uh, people from different countries like Africa who come in and start in churches and there's a, there's a bit of life. There's a bit of uh, strength with the reformed churches. In, uh, there's a bit of... Um, life with the um, charismatics but then there's on mass liberalism that's bigger than it's ever been allowing gay rights to come in the mainline denominations there is uh, confusion amongst evangelical ranks the doctrine of hell being denied uh, morality being denied uh, a lack of s s vigor and defense of the faith compromise and it doesn't look good. It really doesn't look good. It's a very confusing situation amongst evangelicals in, 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 in the West, specifically in England and in America. 
Paul Washer, another Christian, Steve Lawless, and Lawson in America uh, called for the fact that Christians are going to be arrested in America. And that's the reality that's going to happen, and it's already happening in America, it's already happening in the UK. So things are, are pretty bleak and pretty dark. But the encouraging things is that there are uh, there is a remnant, there is a faithful remnant. There are faithful people who are serving the Lord. And the tragedy is is those who are Christians in the Middle East and African countries and other countries that are, are losing their lives. There are many Christians today. Uh, that are really lo uh, are being beheaded, you know, Egyptian Christians being beheaded, Egyptian Christian women being uh, kidnapped, sold into slavery, uh, made to marry Muslim men when they don't want to marry them, um, Christians being killed and murdered by the thousands around the world today. More Christians are, are being martyred today than they've ever been in, in church history. So things are really, really, really bad for God's people in terms of persecution. But the encouraging thing is there is a remnant. There are faithful people uh, and people are serving the Lord faithfully and people are getting on with the, the word, serving the Lord. I think of Haggai in the book of Haggai where it talks about don't build your panel houses but get on building the work. I think of the book of um, Nehemiah where they had to build the wall and you know we need to build the wall and the book of Ezra where Ezra gets up in the pulpit and preaches we need to build on the word of God. And um, you know it's the word of God that, that gives us the strength it's the word of God that builds us. It's the word of God that encourages us. It's the word of God that does the work. And um, I, I, there's a, a movement going around at the moment that's the Christian revival. It's where gold is. So people have gold teeth and gold dust on their face. And gold, you know, there was a, a documentary the other day on TBN, and I like TBN, but the documentary was that this, this, this gold appeared on this guy's crutch. And everybody in the church is looking at his crutch because he's got this bit of gold there and this is supposed to be spiritual revival and it's a mockery of Christianity. It's not true Christianity. It's not true. It's, where's that in the Bible that gold appears and that's revival? That's not revival. That's nonsense. It's absolutely a joke. It's nothing to do with God. And so if you believe that kind of thing, you need to wake up because you need to get some discernment because that's absolute nonsense. There's no in the Bible that talks about true revival is where God is. True revival is where Christ is lifted up, where the word is preached. Yeah. So, there's encouragement that there is a remnant. There are faithful churches. I know quite a few churches around Manchester that are faithful in every pocket, in every area, in terms of denomination, in terms of groupings. But I think that Christians need to work together. You know, the enemy is united in the assault against Christian faith. And we have to be united. And if we're not united, then we're not going to stand. And I, th I do think that reformed Christians and charismatic Christians and evangelical Christians, and we all have to be united, but not compromise the fundamentals of the faith, that the Bible is the word of God, that Jesus is of God that he died on the cross and rose again. We mustn't compromise the fundamentals of the faith. But we must be united. If we're not united, then we're not going to be able to stand. And uh, the enemies are united. They're united in pulling Christianity down. And we have to be united. And there has to be a more emphasis on prayer. The, you know, we need to, there needs to be more prayer. We need more prayer meetings, more times of corporate prayer meeting together in prayer more times of fasting and prayer but prayer is a key prayer is a key and then we have to then we have to um, 
then we have to uh, make a move. We have to do something. We have to make an effort to to spread the truth um, and to reach out. Um, we can't just stand still. So, so we have uh, a great God, and um, we, we can't stand idle. We've got to get on with whatever God's called us to do. So those are so those are some of the thoughts that I have on. Um, So those are so those are some of the thoughts that I have on uh, some of those issues anyway. Um, I do think that uh, there was a a guy um, who was the head of the British Army, but he's retired retired a couple of years ago and he was calling that the, there should be an invasion uh, concerning ISIS and I agree I think that uh, ISIS is a cancer and uh, I think that um, they'll take Syria and they'll take Baghdad I think they have to be stopped and I think the West again is just showing its weak leadership um, so um, but I think the church, um, generally in the West, is lacking uh, weak leadership. There are some good faithful people, but uh, leaders. But I think that uh, we lack um, leadership in the UK. Um, some great leaders in America, but I lack it in in the UK. I think there's a vacuum of leadership in the UK. Uh, Christian leadership. Um, for me at the moment, I think uh, I was on a leadership team. I, I've taken a step back for a bit. I'm thinking I'll be going back, uh, but I just need some time to to be with God and, and to wait on Him. And so for me, it's just a time of waiting on, on the Lord, I think. Um, Seeking him, seeking what he wants me to do. It's so easy to get distracted, uh, to uh, have so many things going on in your life. You just run and you know, actually for what you're called to do. And, and uh, I think I've got distracted, and I think I just need to take a step back. Uh, what I'm about, uh, that's where I'm at at the moment. Um, just try to think of um, apologetics. I used to study a lot on apologetics, but I haven't studied much recently. Um, I think the only stuff that I studied uh, of any depth really recently was Dale Allison's book. Um, on Jesus, and I only got through, I didn't get through all of it, all the book. Uh, and he's not a Christian in the sense of evangelical. Uh, he's a scholar who uh, critiques the traditional belief in the resurrection. But this, you know, I like scholars that are, sometimes you meet a scholar who's the best in their field and they're, they're absolutely brilliant. So Dale Allison's like that. There, uh, it's just he knows his topic. He knows his topic, and so he's the only scholar really that I've been engaged with it with much depth recently. I read an article the other day of his and engaged with it and critiqued it uh, on in in another video. Um, so if you want to look at that, that you might be interested in that. Uh, but I, I like. I like him because um, 
he has an in-depth understanding of the history of his topic. And I, I like, when I study a topic, I like to know the history. Because once you know the history, you get a, a, you get a pretty good idea of the strengths and weaknesses of that particular scholarship. So like, for example, if I'm studying the Old Testament, say, the book of Hebrew, uh, not the book of Hebrew, uh, the book of Jeremiah, I'll look at the history of scholarship on Jeremiah, look at all the great scholars that have written their books and then look at their books and you get a, a sense of the strengths and weaknesses of the scholarship on the book of Jeremiah. Or if you're looking at, uh, say, Karl Marx and, and studying what he had to say, I'd like to look at the history of the scholarship on Karl Marx and see what the scholars have said over the years and you get to know the strengths and weaknesses of that particular scholarship. So. So I like Dale Allison because he's got a, he's got that kind of style that I have, uh, that look in history. You you find that style in my debates. Um, if you look at my debate with uh, negation of P, uh, I give a a potted history of atheism over the last like thirty years in the debate. I do that. And, and, and it that gives you the kind of background. I got that from Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones. Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones taught me that, not personally, but reading his books, and and he would always a historical analysis before he actually got into the topic, which, which uh, style I took from uh, in that area. Um. I think uh, for me at the moment I think even though I'm taking a, a step back I think for me one of the things that comes to my mind is is uh, is that is church and on what church is and for me church is family and I'm very fortunate that I do have a family I do have a church where like I said I've taken a step that back at the moment actually my own space. But I have a family there and I love my family. I love my church family. Um I just absolutely love them. Um and I, I love God's people. It's good to be with God's people. It's good to be around his people. And and I, I just love uh my church family where I am. And uh, you know I perhaps the happiest times that I've had uh, the last eight months is because I've been with a family, a church family. That really is a church family. It really is my family. And I've found redemption in that. I've found hope in that. I've found blessing in that. And families aren't perfect. Families have their problems, but it's family. And I'm just celebrate church life and that church life has been really happy. Um, like I said, church isn't perfect. I'm not perfect, and we have our issues at times. But when you find a church where you feel part of a family, it's a tremendous blessing. And I just want to say to those who are not in church at the moment, maybe you've left church, maybe people have hurt you in church. Uh, I would get hold of Philip Yance's book. I can't remember what it's called, but it's a book that talks about leaving church. And I think Ravi Zacharias has written a book as well for Christians who've left churches at the moment. Uh, so Ravi Zacharias and Philip Yancey have written two good books on people who've been in church and then left them. And I just want to say that to you, if you have left church and you're because you may have been hurt by the pastor, may have been may maybe you've been hurt by other Christians. I don't know. But I, I want to say this is that God is the God of all comfort. That God comforts you, that that you will find a place that where people love you. You will find a place where people care for you. And you know, Bonhoeffer in his book Life Together. Um, says a wonderful thing in that. I've never forgotten it. I think it's really, really important. And he said that those people who look for their salvation in church will never find it. 
And you know something, if you look, if you are looking for something from the church, if you're looking for salvation from the church, i.e. if you're looking for people in the church to minister to you, then you're never going to get ministered to. Because church is just full of broken people. And everybody in church has needs. And so you're going there for them to meet your needs, but there are people in that church that have their needs need to be met. And so you go wanting your needs met, you're going to get frustrated because those needs are not going to get met. Only God can meet your needs fully. So you've got to go to church with an attitude of, of wanting to give rather than take. And that's where the problem is. Because a lot of people just want to go to church to take rather than to give. And I would encourage you to go, to, to find, ask the Lord to show you where where to go. I mean, there, there's a lady that I met once when I was street preaching and she says, I'm not going to church because I saw there was these couples in the church and they they said they were Christians and then they they swapped couples. They got married. To, they, they left their spouses and became married to each. You know, they, there were two couples and they were married and then they switched and got married to, to each other's wives. And this woman left the church said, well, the pastor put up with it. Why should I put up with it? And I didn't go. And these things go on. Um, hypocrisy goes on. Failure goes on. But it says in the word of God, neglect not the assembling of yourself. And you can be blessed for a time not to go into church, but it's not God's ideal. And I think that God, that it, you learn by being in church with God's people. And, and it's not easy at times. You have to humble yourself. At the same time, you know, leaders can be controlling, even the best of leaders, and you've just got to be gracious and just realize that, excuse me, we're all saved by grace. We're all, we're all saved by the grace of God. So don't let that put you off from going to church. You know, you, you're there to worship God. You're there to honor God. You're there to glorify Him. Uh, um, that's what you're there for. Not not looking around your shoulder, what everybody thinks of you or what you think of them. But it's so easy to get distracted with personalities or with issues and about your own needs. So I would say go to church, but go with an attitude to serve and don't be looking at people and just focus on God. Um, that's my advice on, on that. Someone who, who's had an experience of both worlds, I can understand when you've been hurt. I can understand when you've been let down by church leaders, church leaders. But it's got to come point from your perspective is, is to forgive and to forget and it's hard to forgive and it's hard to forget when people have hurt you when people have let you down but Jesus says forgive 70 times 7 and you might say well why don't they forgive well you're not responsible for them you're responsible for yourself so you forgive you be the bigger man you be the bigger woman you forgive and find a place where God wants you to be part of and just knuckle down and do what God wants you to do there Otherwise, you'll spend your time in the wilderness. And you, God can bless you in the wilderness, but it's not God's best for you. Eventually, you've got to come home. And you come home for God and what God wants you to do. I want to talk about anti-intellectualism and intellectualism as well. I think there's a lot of people out there on the internet that think Christianity Christianity is anti-intellectual and um, and I have to say that the church as a whole uh, and I mean the church as in generally uh, the Lord's people can be anti-intellectual a lot of Christians are not interested in finding arguments or uh, positions to defend their faith um, and actually regard anybody with suspicion who wants to study and have arguments for their faith. You've got to be balanced. You've got to be balanced because 
you can get into a, a, a pseudo intellectualism where um, you're actually not depending on the Holy Spirit, you're not depending on the Word of God, but you're depending on pure intellect. And that's dangerous because if you're not depending on the Word and on the Holy Spirit, you're going to go adrift. And so there are some Christians who get into apologetics and it becomes too highly intellectual. I know that I've fallen into that mistake in, in terms of going street preaching. Sometimes I would get into debates with people and it's more about winning the debate than actually getting people saved. So you've got to be very, very careful. But on the flip side, the other side, there are many, many Christians, vast majority, that are not interested in finding arguments and finding evidence for their faith. And I think that's not scriptural. I think it's wrong. And you have to have a balance. It says give a reason for the faith that's within you. It says earnestly, earnestly contend for the faith. It talks about that Christ died and rose again. These are truths that have to be defended. So I want to say to those people out there who are not Christian, looking on at the church, you think that the church is anti-intellectual, and I would tend to agree with that. Most of the church is. However, uh, the church is a big thing. Uh, you have Pentecostals, you have Charismatics, you have uh, Reformed, you have different varieties of Reformed, you have Conservative Evangelicals, uh, you have Anglican Conservative Evangelicals, you have Methodist conservative evangelicals uh, you have baptist evangelicals the evangelicals in america are not the same as the evangelicals in africa the evangelicals in africa are not the same as the australian the australian are not the same as the uk so there's such a variety of there so you've got to be careful not to tie christianity with the same brush but there has there are there has been in the history of christianity a strong intellectual vein i mean for example tertullian was a lawyer uh, even though he said, what does Athens got to do with Jerusalem? He was a great mind. Uh, we think of Origen, who was a great uh, exegete, who studied the great philosophers. We think of uh, Justin Martyr, who was a uh, Christian philosopher. We think of St. Augustine, he was a philosopher, uh, became theologian. Well, we think of um, Luther and Calvin, who both studied uh, at the highest level, on a secular level. Uh, we think of even uh, John Wesley um, studied at a main level, but uh, was a voracious reader, reading Rousseau and uh, many of the uh, continental philosophers, and yet he was uh, a simple preacher of the Word of God. Uh, the Reformed tradition, um, great theologians like uh, Herman Bavinck, the Princeton School of Theologians like B.B. Uh, Warfield, Robert Dick Wilson, um, Charles Hodge and many others and um, so there are strands of Christianity where the Adolf Schlatter in Germany um, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, F.F. F. Bruce there has been there has been um, and many strands of uh, strong vigorous Carl F. Henry uh, is massive magnum opus um, I think six, seven volumes on uh, theology, which uh, is absolutely mind-boggling, uh, the kind of work that he wrote. So the, there is a strong, there has been a strong, there are strands of strong intellectual rigor in, in Christianity. Um, so those who, who are from who've rejected Christianity from the Christian homes because you've asked questions and you've not got answers and, and you've been silenced and said questioning is ungodly well I would assert to you that that's a particular point of view that's not representative of the best intellectual tradition of Christianity and there is oceans of books out there for you to read and to study um, and I would recommend Ravi Zachariah's work. In fact, uh, I will recommend some some uh, apologetic works for you to read. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Christianity is not anti-intellectual. 
but we must be careful not to go over into actual. An example of that, I've said this before, in the 1950s in Manchester, there was Bible rallies of preaching. And, um, and uh, Lord Jones, another great preacher, used to come to Manchester and they used to be packed and they used to preach a simple gospel. But when the preachers got into apologetics and started preaching in the 60s, the whole of these rallies started to shrink because they were relying on the intellect and not the Holy Spirit for power. So that's the danger of apologetics. But at the same time, people like F.F. F. Bruce, Lloyd Jones, and many other great scholars, Bible teachers and scholars, were people who made sure that they did good scholarship. Um, So this is a, this is a helpful uh, website. Prophet Zacharias is, is good. He doesn't debate a lot, but he's very good at uh, philosophy, and, he, and he's good in the sense that he. He stays to the text, he stays biblical, you know. Some people might not agree with um, So that's Ravi Zacharias and it's a very helpful uh, apologetic ministry there uh, and I, I'd recommend it to you um, it's very very helpful and um, and his books are very helpful too so I, I'd recommend that to you uh, just see what else I can get So John Lennox is a good guy, uh, especially if you're an atheist and you're into science and all the rest of it. These are very, he's a very helpful, very helpful scholar. I mean, I, I don't agree with his view on theistic evolution, but to be honest, it, the way he's moving the books that he writes, you would think he's not an evolutionist, actually. To be honest, he's, he writes stuff where actually he gives you information that actually can destroy evolution, yet he's a theistic evolutionist. So I don't agree with him there. But his book, his books and lectures on atheism are superb, uh, and if you're an atheist, I think you would really enjoy his material. Um, and I know that a lot of atheists would have a, a respect for him, being an Ox Oxford mathematician. So I mean, he's very, he's very, his books are outstanding. I've, I've found his books very, very helpful in apologetics. Um, see what else is there. Uh. <laughs> C.S. Lewis Institute is very, very helpful. Um, very, very helpful. Uh, some really good academics there. Uh, some really helpful lectures and debates and discussions. And uh, I found them a real help. Uh, solid, uh, good, 
good resources there, good lectures um, in apologetics um, and way ahead of uh, any atheist or any um, secular uh, critiques of Christianity way ahead. So they're, they're outstanding. Uh, I'm not saying you would agree with everything that they do. Uh, Uh, presuppositional apologetics 101 is a very helpful site and it has um, presuppositional apologetics is the idea that you look at the presuppositions of your opponents and critique them rather than give evidences. Uh, this site is a very good resource. Um, you got Van Til material. Um, so if you look at that, you got Van Til's books that you can get for PDF. Uh, there. You got uh, Greg Banson material there that you can download. Uh, I don't agree with Greg Banson's reconstructionist uh, agenda. Is the onomy agenda? I thought I think he went off the rails there. But his his uh, material critiquing um, critiquing um, this is another site that I found helpful. Uh, John Frame and Vern Poitras. There's some excellent books that you can download here um, and I found them very very helpful so if you go here from an is a very helpful pieces of work so there's some theology there you might not agree with that but um, you've got some great books here you know I don't agree with everything this book on logic I need to read that. That's a great book. I read um, Inerrancy in the Gospels was very, very helpful. Um, so you've got Poitras on mathematics, on philosophy, on science, sociology. Uh, you might not agree with him on the view of Israel, but they're really, really good material to read and, and engage with, uh, whether you're an atheist or whether you're a Christian from whatever theological uh, perspective you, you're at there so on the canon this guy uh, Kruger is very helpful and um, he, there's an interview there with Peter Williams. If you get a chance, Peter Williams is an awesome scholar. Um, so, uh, in fact, we'll, we'll break off and have a break on that. But anyhow, uh, Callum Fodder is helpful in terms of how why we have the canon and stuff like that by Kruger. Uh, very helpful. Um, very helpful site to go to. I found his lectures very helpful. Just go to this one. This is uh, Saiten Brugengate's uh, So that that's his site there, which is a popular presuppositional site. Uh, 
Uh, Westminster Theological Seminary Media is very helpful. Uh, some helpful lectures and debates and discussions on there as well. So. If you can afford it. There are debates and lectures on here that you can pay for. Um, that would be helpful as well at Covenant Media. Uh, it's a helpful place to study the Bible. This is information on the Westminster Confession, which is a, a standard confession that Reformed people f follow and study, and I, I, I study as well. Uh, resources, academic resources uh, on philosophy. This is a very helpful uh, site in the internet, internet encyclopedia of philosophy is very helpful. Uh, these are very helpful as well. I always go to these for help. The Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, I always go to them. If I'm studying a topic or, or something. So, um, some of the scholars there, uh, James White, He's a helpful scholar. Don't agree with everything he says, but he's he's very good. Um, Michael Butler is a Van Tillian. He's a Van Tillian. James Anderson is a very helpful um, apologist, I found. It's very helpful uh, in some of the things that he says. Uh, Apologetic resource on the resurrection is uh, Gary Habermas. I've read probably most of his work now. I've read his PhD. I've read virtually nearly everything that he's, he's done. I've listened to nearly virtually all his lectures. Uh, he's not as sound as I'd like him to be. He's not. I don't think he's a uh, on board with evolution. I think he's, he's an atheistic evolution where I don't believe in evolution. Uh, he might have changed his position. But um, basically I've mastered most of his work, uh, listened to most of his lectures. Um, and his apologetic material is very, very helpful. And uh, so if you want to study on the resurrection, that he, he's the man for that. Definitely. Uh, excuse me.
Risen Jesus is the website of Mike Lycona. He's a scholar, uh, he's written a recent book on the resurrection. Uh, he's got resources here, articles. Um, so this is his site um, he's not an inerrancist uh, he recently caused a controversy by saying that there's probably legendary material in Matthew or something like that and Norman Geisler has uh, taken him to task on that so I don't agree with the fact that he I, I don't agree with his anti inerrancist stance I believe that all scripture is inspired that there are no faults in scripture so I don't agree with Lycona there, but in terms of his work on the resurrection and his work on the resurrection, he's an awesome uh, guy, so I would recommend that. So we have a guest. Uh, welcome, Neil. Hello. Hey, brother. I don't know if you remember me from. Uh Oh, a couple of years ago, I guess it is. I used to uh, type to you in YouTube all the time and tell you God bless from across the water. Thanks, Neil. I, can't, I live in Florida. How are you doing, bro? Are you okay? Good, man. Yeah, I used to talk to you a lot, and then, uh, I don't know, I kind of left the community for a while and came back, you know. And It's good to see you, bro. Any, any thoughts on... Any uh, anything you want to talk about or touch base on or share your thoughts about anything? It's nice to see you, bro. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, you can talk about a million things, but yeah, uh, when I was going through my little uh, epiphany or whatever you want to call it, uh, I, I don't know if I told you I, I was in a wheelchair. I prayed to God. I got out of the wheelchair. Had a miracle happen to me, Amen. and. Uh, and um, I, I was listening to you and a couple other people online at the time. And uh, it really, really, you helped me out a lot when it came to uh, understanding what the Bible says and all that. And Amen, bro. Amen. I remember you had a picture up on your wall that I was always talking about. Uh, you had like a picture on the right side? I think it was yeah, whatever it yeah. was. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, that's lovely. Lovely to hear you, bro. Yeah. Um, yeah, don't mind me, just, you yeah. So, just so uh, what, what have you been reading in the Bible, or what's God been speaking to you about recently, bro? Anything? Uh, recently, Romans 10, 13 comes to mind a lot. When I hear some of these other groups, like the Hebrew Islerites, or yeah. other people that say that only they are saved. And I say, well, you must have not read Romans ten thirteen then, because it says whosoever. It doesn't say what race or mm. any kind of you know who you have to be to be saved. It says whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, and that's Amen. all you need. Amen. Amen. That's that. That's a good thought. Really good thought, mate. Yeah. I uh, yeah. I think uh, we should offer the gospel to everybody. Share, share the gospel to everybody and uh, we're on dangerous ground when we start saying only a certain group yeah. I think I think Jonah had that problem yeah, and I've been talking like... to a lot of people in your part of the world and so uh, yeah they, they kind of have a different take on everything um, I guess they call it like the Americanized version of Christianity that I follow and I'm like well you know I don't believe in the Roman Catholic Church or the Church of England. I guess you could say that. <laughs> but the, the the thing is, Neil, you're biblical. That's the main thing. Yeah. We, so long as we're biblical, I mean, we all have nuances. But I mean, we both believe in Jesus. We both believe in that He died for our sin, and the Bible's yeah. the word of God. And 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 we have to sh share the gospel to everybody and preach the gospel and stuff. And and uh, there are differences over in America and here, but over here is, I suppose, in you know, we can generalize, but uh, like over here, this it's quite complex. You know, you've got the Anglican Church, state church, but then there are lots of other churches, 
evangelicals, yeah. Methodists, you know, and I should suppose in America we could generalise, but I think that it's it's co probably quite a big difference in different areas of states. I don't know if I'm right in that or, you know, like, this, is it the Deep South? It might, it's different from other places. It's, I, I've just been told this stuff, and I'm like, well, I, as long as we believe in Jesus Christ, like you Amen. said, that's all that really matters. You don't Amen. need... If, if you believe in evolution or whatever, I'm not going to say you're not a Christian. I'll just say, you know, you're kind of taking Genesis out of context. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been talking to a lot of um, European people lately, and they, they're, they're positing that the early church fathers that the apostles taught are correct. And I'm sorry, but they're just men to me. All men are valuable, so... Yeah, it's not. Yeah. I'm not going to follow some early early church father, follow, uh, like uh, Saint Clemens or something like that. I don't know who they're talking about, but yeah, yeah, they kind yeah. of confuse me over that. And they say that Genesis is poetry, not to be taken literally. Yeah, and yeah. That's when I'm like, eh, well, I'll disagree with you there. I'm sorry. Yeah, they they kind of like. What what makes me laugh? There's the there's the scholars called the Biologos scholars. They're a bunch of world-renowned scholars and they they regard themselves as um, being sophisticated so they they say they like saying well we got a look at the, the Hebrew writing from its context yeah. and if we if we look at it from its cultural context it's not real history but I'm sorry but Paul knows better than than some of these uh, bi biological scholars and if you read Romans chapter 5 he says by one man's Dis many became disobedient by one man's obedience many became righteous and he's talking about Adam and yeah. he's talking about Jesus and it's quite clear from Paul that he regards Adam as a literal historical <laughs> figure you know so I'll go with Paul any day yeah, it's like they gotta shove millions of years into Genesis somehow calling Genesis 1 and 2 a contradiction and that's where I'm like, okay, well, and a lot of these people that do this are kids. They're not, yeah, yeah. They're not older, or I, I can't explain it. But yeah, they're they're really smart kids. They're in college. They're the top of their fields and whatever. But I mean, that doesn't make you your interpretation of the Bible correct. <laughs> you yeah, know? yeah. And and what gets me is when you when you meet these people, these evolutionists and uh, whatever. And and you talk to them, they always they always snigger and, and, and kind of think that you don't know anything or you don't study anything, as oh. if like you're just a complete ignoramus. But people do go to study, and that's why they don't believe in it. They it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit with the Bible, and it doesn't fit with science, and and that's why it's, people don't. But it's not just out of ignorance. You know, I I was talking to. Uh, at Liverpool University, uh, I was doing evangelism there, and there's, there was this geneticist. Uh, he was doing his PhD, and he was studying under some like, well-known geneticist. And I was arguing, and he was coming up with all these arguments for evolution and stuff. And I just asked him, you know, what's the probability of life coming from non-life? You know, and he, and he like, his eyes twinkled, and within a few minutes, he, he shook my hands and walked off because he knows that if you work on those kind of probabilities you wouldn't do science and it's it's not feasible um so yeah i've got a bunch of papers on uh, abiogenesis and whatever and uh, i i've seen a lot of and not just creationist scientists or or scientists that believe in in god that's not even the point a lot of them they they've proven that they cannot make life from rocks or anything yeah There's no yeah. They may be able to um, draw out some amino acids or whatever, but that's not, that's not, plus here's the problem. Once you touch the rock as a scientist, you yourself become the creator. <laughs> because it didn't happen in nature, because you touched it, all of a sudden you are the intelligent designer. So, <laughs> well, you know, that it kind of defeats the whole purpose of abiogenesis in the first place. Well, that, that, that's what's made me laugh. Uh, Doc could draw a book, uh, I can't remember, something about... Uh, what was it called? Uh, the Greatest Show on the Earth or something. And uh, it was about evolution. And right at the beginning, he talks about he's, 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 given, he's got this computer um, program that he's invented where it simulates evolution. And he's putting the data 
and then he, he shoots it off and then the computer does itself by whatever mutation process he thinks it's, it's mimicking evolution, the, the evolution of developing uh, animals from animal, new animals from different animals type of thing. So, but the thing is, he's putting the com computation in it. He, he's, he's putting the data. Yeah. See, the computer only does what it tells you to do. It. Yeah. I, I'm very proficient in computers. I'm a network engineer. So it's it, to say that a computer can automatically generate random responses that you didn't program into it because you programmed the randomness, the variables into the computer in the first place. Never mind that the computer is an exact copy of the human brain in the first place. That's what, the, you know, that's. It's not. It's not supposed to. It doesn't have cognitive thoughts. It doesn't. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And it never will, unless you told it to. That's really the thing. You can't, it's like, oh, all of a sudden, I've got. Uh, it's self-aware. You can't become yeah, self-aware. Yeah. yeah, that's so awesome, mate. So, is there is anything else? What What else has God been teaching you? Anything else God's been teaching you? What was I, I had a quote lined up, and now I forgot it. It was, uh, oh, the, the theistic evolutionists. Yeah. Really the problem here is that you're to say that God created an imperfect creation that needed to become perfect over time. Brilliant. That is a brilliant thought. You know what I'm saying? And I've heard somebody else say that. I can't take credit for any of this. Do you want to say that is, a, that is really good? I like that. That is yeah, good, I mean, if you're going to say that God created a common ancestor or whatever you're going to say, then you're saying that he didn't create something perfect. It needed to be become perfect. Yeah, yeah. That's really good. Um, what, I, what have I been... I, I was saying I was... A couple of studies that I've done, a few sermons yeah, have preached on. Me. What have you been doing? <laughs> Well, I've been on a leadership team in a church, and uh, so I've been getting involved in that last eight months, and so I've been doing a bit of preaching and stuff, and uh, so a few sermons I preached. One sermon I preached about six weeks ago was on uh, the Holy Spirit. I think it was John, I think, 16, uh, and talking about uh, the Holy Spirit is... Uh, the, the, you have the Spirit, and we worship in Spirit and Truth, um, and I think that I can't remember where that. I think that's in John chapter four, where uh, he's talking to the Samaritan woman, and then he says we, we worship in spirit and truth. So I was talking about the Holy Spirit is a power. It is a person, but a pa an unstoppable power in in sense of the Book of Acts when he starts to move. And I was just saying that you know the church has to trust and believe in the Holy Spirit to do the work that we can try to manufacture the work in the church but that's just human ability that we have to allow the Holy Spirit to work and when he works he's unstoppable um, and then I was talking about real revival the real revival is when the spirit and truth is together and often people are saying that revivals happen that the spirits at work but there's no emphasis on truth and I was saying they both go together uh, so that was one sermon I did um, so I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, there's a bunch uh, of questions that get raised, like, um, what was it? Well, another quote of, actually, uh, William Lane Craig came up with this one. Uh, he got he quoted it from somebody else, was that, I don't believe in Christ because of the Bible. I believe in the Bible because of Christ. Mm -hmm. you know, so it's not, it's not, to get your faith from reading the Bible, that's okay. I'm just saying. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's it's not it's not like saying you know, you can't be a Christian from doing that, but there are people like myself, I believe, that have had a miracle happen to me. So the Holy Spirit did enter me in some way or another. Yeah, and, yeah. And I was trying to tell an atheist that last night. He's like, "Well, I just don't see any reason because I've prayed and nothing's happened." And I'm like, "Well, I prayed too all my life and nothing happened. It just had to be something in God's will on His time." And I couldn't explain to you what happened to me, but in words it's just so powerful I can't even understand I can't I couldn't even want to understand it or I, I, even if I had all the time on the planet I can't yeah. tell you what it was I can tell you what the Bible says it was yeah I think I think I think when they not all of them but often when they use those they're trying to flip it on the, the because you're saying 
it's come by an experience they're trying to flip it on the other side and say well my experience is there was no answer press or checkmate but what they don't understand is is truth is a person that Jesus is a person and that to know Jesus it's a personal relationship just take this guy off sorry about this Neil no you're fine just a it's not going to add anything to the conversation. Yeah, so uh, it's a it's a it's a person, and uh, and unless you meet that person, I mean, you can you can um, you can uh, what you can you can have the sorry about this. Yeah, I really no. felt like I I got through to that person last night um, when I was talking to him. Yeah. I really did feel like I, I said something, and he just, he didn't say anything. He just kept gasping and not really saying anything. <laughs> so, I must have said something that got to him. Yeah, well, they can't deny the reality of what you've experienced. You've experienced the touch of God, and uh, well, and, if it, and if it's sincere and it's real, then they they can't deny that. And, I mean, at the end of the day, that's our... Is it in yeah. Revelation where it talks about the overcome with the testimony, um, and you know we 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 over we tell our testimony and we can testify to what God's done done to us really. What, though, it's not my conscience doing it. I'm not sitting here saying, "Well, I yeah. nothing's gonna stop." It's something inside of me that, yeah. that it's yeah. not my brain. It's something that's making me tick. That's saying. You know, it's it, it drives me. It wants me to keep going as far as I can into this endeavor, you know, yeah. and not stop. But um, I guess uh, enough about me. A uh, new question was a very important issue is Calvinism versus Arminianism yeah. right now. And yeah. I, I, I fall away from the side of Calvinism because I, and I don't really believe in Arminianism either, but you know what I'm saying? I don't like labels at all. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Label myself after a guy named John Calvin would take a lot, and I understand yeah. he had some good philosophies. But to say that everything is predestined, then what's the point of Jesus if it's already predestined? Well, I, to be honest, um, I I don't have the answers. All I know is that th this is the way I see it: is that I just want to follow the Bible. So if we take Ephesians chapter one. And just read Ephesians chapter one. There's quite quite clearly there. It's also about we're chosen before the beginning of time. That we're actually chosen. You know, have you got a Bible on you, Neil? Oh yeah. Because I'm in a I'm in an internet cafe now. So <laughs> I'll, I'll see if I can get. Um, no, I got you. What tra what translation you got, bro? Uh, King James usually. All right, I'll, I'll just get the Bible Gateway. Bible Gateway. It's like the way King James sounds, you know. I have Bible Gateway up here too. Yeah. Uh, let me just get a Bible translation because I'm in an internet cafe. You're good. Um, got to get you some internet. <laughs> I've got. I've got to get my computer fixed. Uh, oh, yeah. But I, it, it's been good for me because I. It means I don't go on as much at the moment. That's why I've not got it. I could get it fixed tomorrow, but I just. It just. It makes me a bit more disciplined. So. Yeah. If you ever need any help, I do it for free. Thanks, mate. Um, so just uh, closing in five minutes. There's a a couple of programs online like Team Viewer and Zoom and whatever. I can uh, control your computer remotely from anywhere in the world. I had my friend in Bulgaria controlling my computer, so. Wow. Anytime you need to get on there, clean anything up or whatever, I'll teach you what to do. Thanks, mate. Thanks, sir. No problem. Ephesians, cha Ephesians chapter 1. Do you oh. want to read the first uh, nine verses and then I'll, I'll just say one or two thoughts and then I'll have to go because it's closing the shop in a sec. One, uh, what do you got, King James or NIV? Yeah, I've got King James here, yeah. Okay, I'm going to do that. Do you think the new King James is any good? It's okay, but it's uh, it, it's not as good as the King James anyway. It's it's uh, it's quite a little bit more uh, modern philosophy and translation. They they say it's tried to be literal, but it's not as literal as they make it out to be. Right. Uh, and it, and Paul, it's, 
Go ahead. It's a bit wooden in the reading. You know, it's not easy reading, clear reading. Well, I like the way, you know, it sounds. Um, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Do I got the right one? The one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Jesus, in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you and peace from our God, our, from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Uh, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us onto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Oh, okay, that'll do, that'll, that'll do the, just, just one thought there, you know, verse 4, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Now, all I, all I would say is personally, I don't I don't. I, my, a lot of the videos that I have are from Calvinists on my channels, but I, I, I I'm not like. Uh, I don't like the labels Calvinist. I don't like the label Amy Arminian. I think we're all believers, but I just go. You just go where the scriptures are, and the scriptures are quite clear there. There that before we were born, some were chosen. Now the danger is, is when you start rationalising and making a system out of it. And that's the danger. So you have to put that with John 3:16. You have to put that with Paul saying he would not want any. God wants not any to perish. That that, that put that with the text that you're talking about preaching the gospel to all. And so I would hold them in tension. And I I, I don't try to make a system. I mean, if you read John Owen's The Death of Death. Uh, if you ever want to know what Calvinism is all about, is read John Owen's Death of Death. I mean, that is the quintessential classic statement. And I don't agree with that book. I've read it, and it's logical, it's precise, but it's a system. And I think, yeah. for me, the Bible's bigger than Calvinism. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, but you have to go where scriptures are, and scripture there, quite clearly, there's something going on about eternity before we were born. And I'll leave. I'll let you have the last four, and I'm going to close in prayer. Over to you, Neil. All right. Um, what uh, what did I leave? Oh, predestined, right? Uh, where am I at? To the praise, glory of His grace, wherein He, wherein He hath, did I, yeah. To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through His blood for the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Yeah, the predestined is uh, in whom also we have obtained inheritance bringing predestined being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will that's pretty good i understand the word predestined in the way it works there but cannot one be not predestined and still pray and receive the glory but that's the issue, you see. That's what. That's the difference between Calvinism and the Bible. Yeah. Calvinism has a system. The Bible is bigger than the system. And yeah. so, at what point? Where the Calvinists would say it's only when God touches you you'll be saved. But if you read the Book of Acts, there's no Calvinism there. The Book of Acts is you go out and preach, and people respond. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. What I'm saying is the Bible's bigger than Calvinism, and you, so you 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 got to be careful. The Calvinists say, uh, oh, until God touches you and you regenerate, you're not going to get saved, and it's only until God regenerates you. Well, you read the Book of Acts. The Book of Acts is not quintessential Calvinistic evangelism. The right. Book of Acts is Arminian evangelism. In other words, you go out 
you preach the gospel and people respond. Yeah, they like respond. Said, that brings back to Romans ten thirteen again, which is what I use every day. <laughs> it's like, you know, whosoever shall call upon the name. Why would you need to call upon the name of the Lord if you're already predestined to be saved? You know. The good questions, mate. We'll have to we'll have to get back to it. I've got to go in a second. So I'm All going right, to close bro. in prayer. But if anybody wants to engage with Neil underneath the video, uh, you know, put your scriptures and give your thoughts, whatever you think. Uh, and, you know, I'm sure Neil, I'll leave it open if you want to chat with people underneath the video, you know, like type in stuff if you wanted to discuss with people. So I'm going to close. And um, Neil, thanks, mate. It's been lovely to talk to you. It's, it's refreshing to talk to a believer in the Lord. And, uh, no and uh, he's who wants to follow the Bible and, and not wishy-washy stuff, so it's really good, bro. And Balanced is loving as well, and you're, you're a loving guy, so that's great. So I'll just close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day, and Father, we don't have all the answers, but Lord, uh, I just pray that you would guide Neo and me to be biblical and to be focused on what you say in the Bible, and not what men say, it's just because they're Calvinist or Arminian. Lord, it's what you say, what your word says, and Father, give us wisdom, and to be faithful but Lord to learn from your people to learn from those who who have studied your word and I pray for Neil Lord I pray that you thank you that you've healed him Lord and I thank you for what you're doing in his life I thank you that he's staying faithful to your word I pray that you'd refresh him renew him strengthen him use him mightily for your glory and just bless him Lord in all that he does for you may every need that he has that you would meet those needs Lord and Father, we just pray for your people uh, around the world today. May they stand fast in you, Lord. And Father, we just thank you for this day and the discussion that we've had, Lord. We pray that it would bring you glory, that you would be honored in it, Lord, that others might join that conversation and get deeper into your word and that we all might grow, that it wouldn't be just arguments, Lord, but that we would want to seek what you say through your word and through the Holy Spirit. And that we might grow in a knowledge of you, Lord. So bless us now. Thank you for Neil. Thank you for uh, brothers and sisters in Christ that we can talk to and share our faith and encourage each other. And those who don't know you today, Lord, may they come to know you. May they know your love and grace today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, Amen Neil. Good to see you, bro. Got to go because the shop's closing, mate. All right, brother. Give me a holler anytime. All right. Give you a holler sometime. Yeah. God bless and love to everybody out there. Thanks for coming, bro. See you. Bye. Take care, mate.